What a great turnout. Thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Sadie Urban. I'm the events coordinator here at the Reserve. Um, this talk is part of the Ralph Newsom Lecture Series, which is funded in part by the Kiko Reforestation Fund, also known as the Newsom Grant, and the Friends of the KV. And tonight we have Larry Sheckle. Um, he's a author and retired science teacher from Toma. And uh, he's here to talk to us about water. And I'm pretty excited because look at all this interesting stuff we have <laughs> that he will share his knowledge on water and some of with a demonstration and scientific explanation. So um, I do need to report attendance for grant purposes, so I appreciate if everyone will sign in, pass it around, and then I will hand it over to Larry. Very good. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, for being here. Larry Shackle, my wife Anne, just went out to get a, a laser pointer that I was going to use. And we were teachers at Toma High School for a total of 70 years, grad graduated. We retired five years ago this spring here. I taught science upstairs, physics, and she was the head librarian, or as the kids once in a while would say, the head barbarian downstairs there. <laughs> but it was a great career, a beautiful school system, good teachers, good board members, good principals, and, and I was very, had a great, very great career there. Yeah, you can just look inside there. Okay, and uh, we're gonna talk about uh, water, the science of water. Uh, we're very informal. I grew up on a large family on a farm, and we have two books out. The science book is Ask Your Science Teacher, which we'll leave a copy here. Also, you can go on Amazon.com, it's in Barnes and Noble and La Crosse and other places. And it's uh, three, uh, 250 of the questions and answers that we have in the newspaper. We write a science column for the Toma Journal. Every comes out every Thursday. We get it on Friday. And then uh, I grew up on a farm outside of Seneca, 238 acres, and I wrote about growing up in the 40s and 50s there on the farm, and that's. Uh, called Seneca Seasons, A Farm Boy Remembers There. And that's also on Amazon.com, and we can give you the contact information. We sell, when we go out and do book signs, we have quite a few, we sell each book for $12, uh, which is quite reasonable, or two for 24 specials. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anne, if you would uh, change slides there. Yeah, so if I have to mail there a little bit more there. So we're gonna go right down the line here. Anytime you have a question, don't hesitate to ask. We'll go about 40, 45 minutes, and everything you want to know about water tonight. So the next one there, uh, that's, well, that's water right there, H2O. As you can see, one, one atom of oxygen and two atoms of hydrogen. Um, water is a universal solvent, well known, next one. Uh, all cell parts dissolve in water, next one. Water is the only substance on Earth that exists in all three states. A solid, ice, liquid water, gas, vapor, or steam. Sometimes people say steam, okay? Water is odorless, tasteless, and has a slight bluish tint when in large quantities. And there's night, night reasons for that. It has to do with how light behaves in water. In small quantities, you hold a little bit of water in your hand. It's just clear or colorless. Next one. And next one. Our body is about 70% water. And there's all the things that water does for us. Next one. And 70% of the earth is covered with water. Next one. We are a water planet. Less than 3% of that is fresh water. And most of that, 98%, is in ice and groundwater. Next one. So we're going to take a, make a piece of the Great Salt Lake. Now, we were out to the Great Salt Lake a few years ago, and I brought some back, and I've kept it for years, and I threw it away. But the Great Salt Lake, nobody has ever drowned in the Great Salt Lake because it's from five to 27% salt. So we're gonna make a piece of the Great Salt Lake here. I have 100 milliliters of water, and I have here four and a half grams of salt. So that's that much salt, four and a half grams of salt. So if I put it in here, like that, uh, now we have a piece of the Great Salt Lake. Uh, now you say, why five or 20 to 25, 27%? Well, in the spring, when you get a lot of melt from the snow, then it's, you're going to have, it's not going to be as salty. As the summer goes on, a lot of water evaporates, the salt remains, so you have more saline, more, more salty there. Um, next one. There is a great salt lake in Utah, and uh, uh, it's a wonderful place to visit. There's not much fish in there, a lot of brine, brine shrimp. That's next one. And that is Mono Lake, which is just east of Yosemite. That's over 10% salt. 
and it's basically a lake that is landlocked, it's not <coughs> fed by springs, and therefore it becomes saltier and saltier, almost like the Dead Sea. Uh, next one. Now the density of water is a gram per milliliter, or a gram per cubic centimeter is the same thing. If you go and take a thousand times each of that, it's a kilogram per liter, and it's 62.4 pounds a cubic foot. So if you have a cubic foot of water, 62.4 pounds. Now if it's salt water, they usually give it a 64. Next one. It has a specific gravity, and it's a very simple idea. It's the density of something divided by the density of water. So the specific gravity of water is one. Uh, next one. How do you measure the specific gravity? Well, there's several ways, but there's one over there which is a hydrometer. When I get over there, I'll show that one there, see? A, a weighted stick, basically. Uh, next one. It has its greatest density at 39 degrees or 4 degrees centigrade. Now that's very important, next one, because here's the density of water. 4 degrees is right above there. When it gets warmer, it's less dense. When it gets colder, it's less dense. So it reaches its greatest thickness, you might say, or density at 4 degrees. Next one. Now if that didn't happen, imagine what happens now for a typical lake like Toma or any of the lakes that we have around here. Fall comes on, it gets cold, so the top layer gets 4 degrees, which is 39 Fahrenheit, and because it's the most dense, it goes down. The next layer, you might say, in contact with the cold air gets colder, gets down to 4 degrees, it goes down. That happens until the whole lake is 4 degrees. Now the top part is getting colder and colder, like 3 degrees, 2 degrees, 1 degree. It can't go anywhere because the water below it is more dense, so it freezes. Now that's very fortunate because of the next one there. If water didn't reach its density at 4 degrees, let's say it reached its greatest density at 0 when it froze, that top layer would freeze and go down. The next layer would freeze and go down, and the whole lake would be frozen from the bottom to the top and never really thaw out, see, okay? So that's why we have a lid of ice. Now if you go to any really deep lake, like Lake Tahoe or Lake Superior, and you ask anybody, well, I wonder what the, now they're about a thousand feet down. I wonder what the temperature of that lake is at the bottom uh, on August 4th at three o'clock. You can say, Four degrees, see? Because that water will always be four degrees. Like I said, it never gets uh, so deep, it never gets uh, warm enough, see? So the whole lake turns over. In the fall, the cold water goes down, the warm water comes up, and just the oxygen in the spring, and that uh, oxygenates the fish and so forth. Uh, next one? Four degrees centigrade? Four degrees centigrade, or Celsius, yeah. And what would it be in Fahrenheit? Uh, 39 in Fahrenheit, roughly, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as water freezes, it expands about 9% of volume, making it less dense, hence ice floats on water. So next one there, Anne. So icebergs, roughly 90% of the iceberg is underwater. And, and, and here I have some water, and I have an iceberg in this water. It's not a very big iceberg. Uh, okay, and next one, Anne. So you know, and you know from experience, that the iceberg is above the water, 90% below, about 10% roughly above. So the question always happens or asks, if when that ice, when it's really full, it's all the way full to the top, when that ice melts, will the level of that water go down, will it go up, or remains the same? And that's a kind of a problem you give to high school students in chemistry and physics and so forth. And the answer is that it stays the same because it's less dense, therefore you have some on top, roughly 10% there, see? So when that melts, that takes the volume of the water that was there, then, see? So the answer is stays right the same, yes? Question, so that being the case, then people talk about global warming, uh -huh. and the danger of living near the uh, edge of uh, the ocean, uh -huh. uh, that when the icebergs melt, they will be flooded. That's not the case. I, you know, that's a good question. I don't know if I have a good answer to it. Well, I think the, it's the, the, the most of that water that is in ice now in the ice caps, that will melt and that raises the water level out there. See, I think glaciers, that's... Glaciers, not icebergs. Pardon? Glaciers, not icebergs. Glacier, glaciers. Glaciers come in from the shore. Yeah. Okay, next one. Uh, it has a very slight negative charge, and the reason for that is that the oxygen is positive, 
and the two little ears of the uh, molecule are negative. And there's a nice, easy way to show that. I'm going to try to show that right here. I'm going to put some water uh, draining here. And it has a little hole here. I put a little, of, of just a tad of uh, dye so you can see, the, see it a little bit better. I'm going to take this balloon here, which I'm going to make very uh, charged, and bring it up here. You see that moving? Yeah. Or right, any old over here, like that. Uh, you can do that at home, boys and girls of all ages. If you have a comb, you can run it through your hair. Whoops. If your hair doesn't have a lot of mousse or anything, you have a kind of junk in there. And that should do it. Okay. Oh, yeah. Moving it like that. Okay. Uh, so next one. Chrome is positively charged. Pardon? Chrome is positively charged. Positively charged, yes. Uh, next one. And we can kind of show that right here. So here, here's the balloon, which I have slightly negatively charged. And in the water stream, all of the positive charges are drawn over to here, and the negative charge is right here. So that's why it, re it repels that. See, the water vector has a positive area on one end, negative on the other. It's a poor molecule. Uh, next one. It has a very high surface tension. And surface tension is the tendency of a liquid to act as a thin rubber membrane, like it had a rubber top to it. And next one. And the reason for that is that you have a water molecule here. It's pulled in every single direction by adjacent water molecules. But on top, on the surface, it only pulls in that direction because there are no water molecules up here to go in that direction. And therefore, you have that surface tension there. And you see that uh, typically you can put a needle or a small uh, paper clip on water. Skeeter bugs, both the skeeter bug and the paper clip are more dense than water. And if you push that skeeter bug under the water, as we do to kids on the farm, it's a death trap for them because they're trapped underneath the water there. See? Yeah. Uh, next one. Now I'm going to try to show that another way here. Um, the idea of surface tension, surface tension always likes to make the smallest area as possible. And so I've got some water here that I'm going to have come out some holes, three holes in here. And I put a little bit of uh, dye in here. There we go. Now I don't know how well you can see that, but there's three streams here. I'm going to block it. It's one stream. I want to flick it through. Three streams. Block it, there's one stream. Because if you have one stream, that's less surface area than three streams added up. See? So here's our three streams. Uh, next one, Anne. If I block it just briefly, those three streams go into one. See? So it's a simple little way to show surface tension there. Uh, next one. I'll just go pour this water out here. Okay. Now, capillary action is the rising of liquids in thin tubes. It's due to adhesion and cohesion. Uh, next one. Now, adhesion is a force of attraction between different molecules, like water and glass. See? And cohesion, it's another word for surface tension, is the force of attraction between like molecules, water, water. See? So if you have a liquid in a container, it likes to pull up on the side there because of the force of attraction of adhesion. However, in the bottom, it tries to, right here, it tries to make the smallest surface area. So when you have a real small diameter tube, such as this one right here, this is smaller than this one, it creeps up along the side, that's adhesion, but cohesion wants to make it smaller, less surface area in the middle. So it, that force of cohesion and adhesion acting together to cause it to rise in small diameter tubes. Now that's why water can get way up high on like a 300 foot sequoia tree, is because of, of capillary action. Uh, next one. Now another way to show that is uh, a simply one that you boys and girls of all ages can do at home. And I did this one about two weeks ago. I simply took some water, I put some red dye in it, and I put some salary in it. And of course the salary was green when it started but it all turned red because the water rolls in those small diameter tubes. Now the action of a wick with candle, that's capillary action. The drying of a towel, like a, like a paper towel, that's capillary action. Uh, next one. 
Now, water is not compressible. You can compress uh, gases. You can squeeze uh, gases, but you can't squeeze water. Now, to try to show that, I got here a, a bottle, and I'm told it's an old bar room trick. And in Toma, fortunately now, there's two or three churches that have gone in. So right now, we have more churches than we have bars in Toma. I think that's progress. <laughs> But I'm told it's an old bar room trick where you take your hand and you, you have a beer bottle or a pop bottle or whatever, you go like that, and the bottom drops out. So I'm going to try that not with my hand because it's kind of hard on the hand. I'm going to use a, a, a mallet. So I'm, all I'm going to do is I'm going to hit there, see? Now when I hit there, I'll squeeze the air. We can compress the air, but we can't squeeze the water. So that compression wave will hit the water go down to the bottom and take the bottom up. We'll give that a try right here. Like so, see? Water is not compressible. Easy way to show that. Extra credit if you want to glue that back together. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, next one. Now, this is called water hammer. Now, I lived in an old farmhouse in Crawford County down there. And Crawford County has a lot, like Monroe County and Vernon County, it's hill country, unglaciated, driftless country. And the roads are very crooked. Um, they're so crooked they could almost run for Congress, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we had a faucet in the basement that when you turn that faucet off, the pipes are duh, 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 like that, see? And that's called water hammer. Now what's happening is that when the water is turned off, it stops suddenly and it causes then the pipes to vibrate, see? Now I'm gonna kind of show that with this right here because there's water here but there's nothing here but air. Uh, I should say there's a vacuum and there's no air. So when I go rapidly up like this, you should hear it's kind of a click. Hear that? Like that. Now if that was air, that we would never hear anything like that, see? So that's called a water hammer. Uh, next one. Pure water is a poor conductor of electricity. Now, of course, <laughs> You don't want to try that by throwing an electrical hot iron or something in the bathtub or anything like that. You don't want to chance that, see? So what we're going to do is we're going to try to show here that water is conductive. I have here a little, one of those little Christmas tree bulbs. And if I go like this, you can see that the bulb lets here. It's a 2.4 volt bulb. I have uh, four and a half volts here. And then I have a stick here, which is copper. And uh, if, I, if I touch it, of course, the light will come on, like that. Copper's a good conductor. Now, if I put it in water here, you don't see that light come on. Now, that water is just regular water. It's slightly conductive. I'm going to try to make it more conductive, very conductive, by putting salt in there. So I got some salt here. We'll put the salt in there. We'll stir the salt a little bit. Uh -huh. OK. Now we'll try it here. Put that in here. And you can see the light comes on. See that light there? If you're kind of, if you're in the back, you might want to stand up to see it. It's not, it's not very bright. It's kind of like a freshman, you know? Okay? And there, there it's kind of like a senior. They're not, they're not that bright. <laughs> okay. So water becomes conductive because now we put ions in there. Conductors of electricity. Uh, next one. And there is without salt in there. Next one. Uh, just, and there you can see the light bulb lit. And if you kind of find it hard to see that, that's what we did there. Okay, next one. Now water ha and everything has what's called specific heat. And specific heat is the heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of material, one degree centigrade. One degree centigrade, one gram, one gram is like a half a range. Okay, next one. Here are various specific heats with aluminum, brass, copper, iron, lead, tin, and water. And you can see that all of the metals, the common metals, are all around 0.1. Some a little bit less right here, some a little bit more, but there's only a few metals that I put down here. They're only about 0.1. Water is much more. Here it is in the metric system right here, see? That means it takes a lot of heat to heat up water. And once you have it heated up, it'll give off a lot of heat, see? That's why it's so good in radiators, basically, even though it's alcohol. Uh, black hole, it, we, it's still mostly water there, see? And you kind of know that because in the fall, you know the, the, the land will be frozen, but your lakes are still water. It takes a lot of heat 
to get out of that water so that it freezes that See, uh, Next one. Now to try to show that, I'm gonna try to show that in a, a different way here. Here's a balloon and I put some water in there, okay? And what I'm gonna do is take and put a flame to it, okay? Now hopefully that's not too much of a flame. Okay, so I'm gonna take that flame now what I didn't show you is if you took that flame to a balloon, it would break the balloon right away because it would melt it, see. But I'm going to try to bring this up here like this. This doesn't always work, so i got to go over here like that. I'm going to heat that right there. Hold it right there. Hold it right there. It's leaking. I, I tore a little hole in it right there. Sometimes that happens on cheap balloons there, see. But if that was not didn't have water in there, the balloon would have been melted instantly, see. What happens there is that water kept the surface here. The water kept the surface from getting hot enough to burn a hole in, see? And matter of fact, if you don't have that little pinprick there, which I do here, you could boil that water. The water would actually boil before the balloon would break, that see, like that. So it has a huge amount of specific heat. Uh, next one. Now water can bend light, it's called refraction. And of course, you and I are familiar with that when we put something in water. Like if you put a ruler or something in water, or you go, uh, same thing with spear fishing, it, it's higher, it appears to be higher than it actually is. If you took a laser and you shine it down into water like this, it would bend toward what we call the normal here. And the reason it does that is that water, the light will slow down in water. Light in air travels 186,000 miles a second. But in water, it only travels like 140,000 miles a second, much slower. And therefore, it slows down as it does that. Now, you could also shine a laser underneath here, and it would bend like this. If you kept bending this over and over, in other words, like brought this up here like this, pretty soon the ray would not come out of the surface at all, but go along the surface like that. That's called a critical angle. For water, that's 49 degrees. For glass, it's 42 degrees. See? And we use that idea a lot in optics, such as binoculars and so forth, that we use to reflect. Basically, the tr prism acts as a reflector there. If you go beyond that angle of critical angle, it is totally internally reflected. And that's the concept behind fiber optics. That's how what makes fiber optics work there, something like that. Now, I'm going to try to show that in a, a unique way here. Uh, next one there, Ann. Okay, this you're all pretty familiar with this. You put a pencil in water, you look at it from the top here, it appears to be here. If you're spear fishing, your fish might appear to be here, but it's actually down there, so you have to aim lower and closer than you, when you see it then. Okay, next one. Now I have here a beaker, and this is a beaker, uh, a small beaker inside a big beaker. And they have an in, a glass has an index of refraction of 1.5. For water, it's 1.33. Now that means that glass will bend light more than water will. Uh, go back one several there, Ann, if you could. Okay, now go back another one. In other words, if this were a ray here, it might bend here like this. Now if you had it, say, if it was water, it might be here, but glass would bend a little bit more, come right, right about here. And diamond would really be about here, see? Diamond is 2.42, something like that, see? Now, it so happens that Western oil has the same index of refraction, the same bending qualities as water. So I'm going to put, I'll try to show this so that you all can see it while I'm doing it, okay? I'm going to take this uh, Western oil, we'll get it right in the middle there. I'm going to pour it in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you can see the glass inside the glass there, right? No problem. I'm going to pour more, pour more. Oh, the cup runneth over. Okay. And now it's disappeared, see? All you see is the writing on the, gla on the wall there, see? Because it doesn't, the, the oil doesn't bend light any more than the glass does. So it disappears then, see, like that. That's kind of a magician's trick too, where they will use a various substance that has, a, it's usually a liquid. Uh, the ACE use those carbon tet, which is not the good because it's cancer causing. And they would put a test tube in the carbon tet, and they'd have a, one that they would break up, have a kid or a thing break up and put in there. And then they'd go in and they'd draw out the one that they put back together again. 
Well, that one that was put back together again was there all the time. You just couldn't see it there, see? So it's the same kind of idea here. Okay, next one, Anne. And, <clears throat> and there it is, and then with the oil, and it's disappeared. Okay, next one. Now, uh, we can show that another way, too. I have here a, um, a glass. Now, this is a mug uh, filled with uh, water, colored water. And I'm going to take and pour water around it. So, I'll try to do that so everybody can see it nicely. You want to get your money's worth here. <laughs> okay. There. Now, can you see that, how it's different? Uh, let's show it right here, like that. And maybe I'll pull it out here so you can see it a little bit better. The, at the bottom there, you can actually see the outline of the actual glass, whereas was before, it looked like it was water all the way out to the side. Now, who used that? Well, A and W root beer used that, see? That idea that had a really thick glass. Remember how the old-fashioned A and W? They're very thick, almost a half inch thick, see? And when you put A and W root beer in there, it looked like the A and W went all the way from wall to wall. But it didn't, see? You got less root beer than you thought you were getting. <laughs> yeah. My, my brothers and I and Bill Bowlen, we'd go down to Prairie Sheen to the A and W outdoors. Uh, there and we had ordered like three or four root beers and some hot dogs and then the lady come out and she'd get some of the glasses and then she would order more root beers and we almost always we so confused her we stole one almost every time we went down there so <laughs> don't tell anybody <laughs> okay we did give them back I think okay next one in now we'll go right over here we have a, what's called a tantalus cup and tantalus from Greek mythology was that dude that he was standing in water, and when he reached up to grab something, the water was, it would always be out of his reach. And when he reached down for something, the water would recede. That was Tantalus. And so I have a, a Tantalus cup here, and what I'm going to do is pour water in here. So you can see that it's a crook here, like that. And uh, we'll catch that water here. Now, we'll get up to the top here, right there. And notice now, so far, I'll stop right there. Our tantalus cup is not draining, okay? I'm gonna go right to the top there, right to the top there, okay? And now, it'll drain the entire contents, basically siphoning it. See, like that. Now you might think, well, I've never seen a tantalus cup before, but your, your, your toilet is a tantalus cup, see? It's designed that way, and you don't see that crook because that's behind the, all that porcelain there, see? The idea of the tantalus cup is that you don't want sewer gases coming up and getting in your house. So the toilet has to flush, and when it gets to the height of that crook, which you can't see, the whole contents of the toilet will flush that, see, like that. And, uh, there's some intermittent, uh, they're called artesian wells. We don't have any around here, not the intermittent type that I know of, but they'll run 20 minutes, stop 20 minutes, run 20 minutes. They're basically a cavern in the, in the rock that's filling up, when it gets filled up, it all drains, and then it stops running until the groundwater fills it up again. So it's an intermittent Cartesian diver there, see, a Cartesian uh, well, if you will. It's a tantalus cup there. By the way, it's interesting how the modern toilet came about is uh, the patent is by an Englishman and his name is Thomas Crapper <laughs> who greatly enriched the English language. It was around 1872, something like that. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I'm glad I didn't invent that. <laughs> well, I gotta go to the shackle. You wouldn't want that. <laughs> okay. Go to the next one there, Ham. Okay, you can also make water sink, actually a glass sink. So you go to a fancy restaurant, say like McDonald's, you get one of these right here, and you can make it sing. Now let's see, I probably should put this down. And it doesn't make any difference how fast or how slow I go. I go real fast, go slow. And the reason that makes a sound is that the top here is vibrating back and forth. See what it's doing. It's kind of the vibration mode 
is kind of like this for the top there. It's kind of doing like this, like that. That's the mo motion that what's happening there, see? Now, if you want to do that at home, I highly recommend that you use vinegar because you have to cut the oils on your fingers. You can't have any oil or soap because your fingers can't slide. They have to start and stop hundreds of times a second. It's the same reason that you use a rosin on a cello uh, bow or a violin bow, is you don't want that bow sliding on the string. You want that bow to grab the string and tension it, then release and grab it again, grab it again over and over, see, like that. Like so. so I got a little vinegar in there so it'll make it sing like that. And you can have less water, more water, um, and things like that, and get, get a different sound in there, see, like that. Okay, next one, Anne. Now we can make water work for us. Uh, how did Hero, or Hyro sometimes it's pronounced, uh, do it? Well, he used a, an engine, and go well, the next one. He was about uh, several hundred years before the time of Christ, and he basically boiled water, and the water turned to steam, and he had a device, something like this, I'm told it opened the temple doors. Well, we got a different one here. This uh, temple here, this is the float in the, on the back of a toilet. Uh, this one's copper, and most of them today are plastic, the black plastic, go to Menards or something like that. I drilled the holes in there and put a little spout here that I um, soldered in. So I got some water in there. We're going to heat that water, and then well, the water will turn to steam. The only place it can come is out here, and so there's steam out. That's action, and in this direction, reaction. So it's action-reaction there, see? Now, there are actually action-reaction pairs. Well, they, they operate as pairs. So I'm going to heat that water. It's going to take about four or five minutes for it to work, like that, to get that water hot in there. Whoops, I should have got that up just a little bit more, like that. OK, so we'll come back to that in just a second as my main squeeze goes on to the next slide there. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now this is called hydraulic, hydrolysis. If you apply a DC voltage to a water, uh, you can break that down into hydrogen and oxygen. So it's called electrolysis. Here's a real simple one that you can do at home. Take any 9-volt battery, uh, use pencils like this, uh, attach it, and you'll see the bubbles come out. Uh, in the higher levels of science, what they will do is they'll catch the uh, oxygen and hydrogen tubes. Then you do a test for them. You use a splint to test for oxygen because it'll burst into flame. And you use a little match to test for hydrogen because it'll get a little, boop, a little pop, your hydrogen explosion. So what I did before y'all came in, I, I did that next one to a car. And it's a hydrogen powered car. It's a fuel cell is what it is. And so I should have a tank of hydrogen and a tank of oxygen here because I tied a battery. I tied this battery to it a few minutes ago there, see, like that. And next one there. And then, so we have developed then a little canister of hydrogen gas and a little one of oxygen gas. And if you take those two gases and feed it then to a membrane, you produce water and electricity. That's how fuel cells work. Um, go to the next one there, Anne. There's that, it's called a um, proton membrane, and you're basically putting, uh, you're putting oxygen to this side, hydrogen over here. And when it comes over here, these holes here are too big for the molecule to go through, for the atom, the hydrogen atom to go through. The electrons are stripped off. So the electrons go here, see, like that. And over here, the oxygen gas, that combines with those electrons and the proton here to give you water. So in a fuel cell, you're using hydrogen gas and oxygen gas to produce both electricity and water. And the fuel cells were used on the Apollo program. Uh, so they're very common, they've been around for a long time. So now I think I will connect that. Go to the next one there, Anne. There's that membrane there. Uh, next one. Yes, and then I'll hook it up here. So if we, I think we have enough gas collected here. And 
I won't put it on the, but there it's running there, see, like that, see. So we're using the oxygen here, hydrogen here. We're now producing both electricity and water to run a little motor that runs our, our hydrogen powered car here, like that. And it'll run for about five or 10 minutes until you get all of the gases used, then you have to make more, see, like that. I'll just set it here so that, and raise it up here, like that, and let it run there. Okay, uh, next one, man. Oh, I forgot one there. I have this emissible idea. Now, um, there's many ways to show that certain liquids don't mix. And this is the water at the bottom, and any kind of oil, um, baby oil, uh, it could be alcohol, um, mineral oil, because they're carbon-based, and water is not. So these two liquids do not mix, that's called immiscible. This one was made by a student at St. Paul's School up in uh, Toma there, the daughter of the state farm agent, and she brought it to physics class uh, years later after she had made this one here. Now, uh, next one. Uh, oops, I think you went the wrong way there. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Divers vents. Well, uh, divers vents <coughs> is an illness <coughs> a malady caused when a diver goes deep. And when the diver goes down, for every 33 feet, the pressure is, uh, develops is twice as much. So it's depth and time is dependent. So the deeper they go and the longer they're down, more of the nitrogen gets dissolved into their bloodstream. See? And uh, then when they come back up, that dissolved nitrogen comes out and forms little bubbles and blocks air, blocks blood flow. So they bend over in pain. And if it goes too much, they can have uh, goes to the brain and kill them. See? So I'm going to try to show that in a different kind of way. I have a baby bottle here that has no nipple, uh, has no hole in the nipple. Okay? And I'm going to take another gas that is dissolved in here. And that would be, of course, carbon dioxide. So in here, under high pressure, they dissolve a lot of carbon dioxide. You can get a lot of it out by shaking it. A little comes out when you do this, like that. And so what I'm going to try to do is pour some in here. Mm, I'll go over here because I might spill some here. Try not to make too many bubbles as I'm pouring. There. Now, what the divers can do to prevent the bends is come up very slowly. They can come up to a certain level and stay there for a while, come up some more, come up some more. So if they're down, say, 100 feet, and they're down there three hours, it takes them almost, almost three hours to get out of the water. So typically what they do is they'll come up uh, very quickly and they go into a hyperbaric chamber. And that basically pumps oxygen into their system there, see, like that. Now I'm going to put this nipple on here like this. Now maybe just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Our hero's engine should start working pretty soon now. Okay, put this on here like this. And oh, I have had accidents with this one too. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to shake it. And when I shake it, a lot of this dissolved carbon dioxide will come out as a gas. That's a lot of that pressure there, see, like that. That's what happens to the diver when he or she goes down in the water. That it gets dissolved into their bloodstream, and then when they come back up where there's less pressure, all those little bubbles block the blood flow. So I'm going to put that back in here, like that, like so. Okay, just starting to work there. Uh, next one, and that's kind of what I showed. Now, this, this is a kind of a unique thing. It has uh, alcohol here, 70% alcohol, which means alcohol mixed with a little bit of water, and water down here. And notice the beads there. We've got beads, white beads here, and uh, blue beads here. I'm going to shake this and just set it down right here. And we'll observe it. The white beads are at the top. The blue beads are at the bottom. But Something strange and wonderful is going to happen. That's the same kind of relationship I have with my wife. Strange and wonderful. She's wonderful and I'm strange. Okay? 
notice that our white beads are going down and our blue beads are coming back up. Now in industry, this is called a salting out process because there's kosher salt in there. Kosher salt is very clear salt. If you use regular salt, it would be sort of milky, but kosher salt is very clear. And the salt attaches to the water more than it does to the alcohol. And therefore, we're sort of separating out the water and the alcohol. All the alcohol will be up here, less dense, <coughs> excuse me, and the more dense water down here. And they'll go back to where they originally were there. Okay, we should have this baby working here pretty soon. Now go to the next one there, Ann. I will move this over a little bit. Maybe I should raise, lower that just a little bit here. Closer. There, that might be better. Okay. Now you know, now by the way, here's that hydrometer, which you can see is just barely floating in water. And if I raise it up here and look at the scale, it says one. Well, the specific gravity is one, see? So a typical hydrometer, there are one that are used for sugars, alcohols, and so forth. There are some that are for specific gravity more than water, such as, say, a benzene, carbon dioxide, things like that. I'm not sure about benzene. Uh, and less dense. And uh, that's one way that they use in factories they use to measure the specific gravity. <coughs> I'm going to put a diet Pepsi or diet soda in here. Oh, the bowl runneth over. And then a regular here, and this is kind of a common thing that kids do in school because the regular is on the bottom and the diet is on top. How many kids knew that? Well, you don't now, you see. And the reason for it, by the way, that's a good problem because you can ask students, why would the diets, and you have a lot of different ones, why are the diets on top and the regulars on the bottom? They can come up with the, well, maybe it is the color of the can. Maybe it's the shape of the can. Maybe it's salt. Um, we came up with nine or different things that could possibly be. And it turns out it's sugar. Sugar is what's the reason. It's the next one there, Ann. Because here are cans of diet which have no sugar. This is what the can weighs. These are cans of regulars. That's what they weigh. So, and of beers, that's a graduate program owned by there. So. <laughs> They're always uh, got four or five percent alcohol in them, and so they uh, they're going to always be at the top. There, say like that. Mm. There's a number of things you can try. For example, if you put wood in water, everybody knows that wood floats, but there are some woods that don't, like rosewood. Rosewood is a very beautiful tonal property. That's why I used in musical instruments. See, so that's an example of a different one. A scoria is one. Uh, ivory ironwood is uh, ironwood is another one. See. Then everybody knows if you put rocks in water, they sink. But then there's examples, there's pumice is one that's right, that does not. See, it floats at the top there, see? Uh, a next one there, Anna. Okay, can we make water disappear? Well, I need, I need a, a, a volunteer. Yes, you're gonna help me right there. Uh, is it, what was the name? Jonah, Jonah. Uh, here's some water here. Um, I have a, I'll pour the water. You take the top cup, okay, and I'm going to pour water in there. Whoops, so I see it's a little colored water there, because I had some bad color in there. Pour that in there. Pour. Pour right there. That's good. You can just set that down there, see? And uh, you can see our Hyros, our Hero's engine is working there now. We've turned the water into steam. The steam is coming out, action, reaction, uh, there, very typical. But the water, for example, I noticed here the water down here in the far area, very dry water. We got wet water up there in Toma. We got dry water, down. just to show you how dry it is, I take this cup, I turn it upside down. The water doesn't even come out, see? That's dry water, okay? Yes, yes, okay. And our last one here that we're gonna do is, uh, when I was a boy in Seneca, we went to church and they'd read about those miracles in the Bible, you know, like, raising Lazarus from the dead, uh, feeding 5,000 people with some loaves and fishes and so forth, uh, making the blind eye, blind man see with mud. Uh, Jimmy Kazalka, our neighbor, tried that with mud. He couldn't see any better. <laughs> but the one that always intrigued me was the wedding feast at Cana, see? Because at the wedding feast at Cana, they served the good wine first, and then they kind of ran out of wine. And so then uh, they had to make 
their own wine messy. Uh, so I so I got I'm gonna put some water together here, and so now we'll see what we have here. Well, look at that. Yes, water to wine, Chardonnay. <laughs> 83. I think the grapes came from the south side of the bush. <laughs> mm, three fourths of the way up. Okay. All right, next one, Anne. I think we're there. We are. Anne and I thank you for being here today. And next one, there. And we'll entertain any questions that I can't answer. <laughs> yeah? Any questions at all about water, teaching, life? Science. Science, yes. I have two questions about sure. water. Um, yeah. I heard that water is like exactly zero degrees Celsius, so it will go from liquid to solid back and forth. Yeah, that's that's true. That that is right because yeah. that's right on the line there. And I also heard that hot water can freeze faster than cold water. Yeah, that, that's a very good one, and the, and, and it can uh, mm -hmm. under certain circumstances. If you took say uh, one of, I'm going to turn this off here. If you took a regular container of water and put it in a fridge of hot water and cold water. The hot, the cold water would freeze first. But if you pour that water into a like a big cake pan where it's really spread out and put them both in the freezer, then the hot water will, will freeze first because you have so much loss of mass due to evaporation. Yeah, so it's very special conditions for that. Very good questions there. Yeah. Any others? Yes. Yeah, you could mention heat of vaporization and heat of fusion. Yeah, heat of, heat of fusion now is the heat necessary to change a gram of water to ice. And that's 80 calories per gram. So when you heat or cool water, it takes 80 calories to change from, it'll give off if you go one way, it requires 80 if you go the other way. The heat of vaporization is roughly 540 calories per gram. So if you want to change one gram of water to one gram of steam or vapor, that's how much heat is required. <coughs> Excuse me, about 540 grams there. Yeah. Yes. And that's why <coughs> ice cubes don't instantly melt. Pardon? That's why ice cubes don't instantly melt in water. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah. Any other good, very good questions? Any others? Okay. Oh. Yes. Where'd the water go in your cup? <laughs> <laughs> well, can you keep a, can you keep a secret? <laughs> yeah. So can I. <laughs> but I will give this one away. A sponge. No, no, we had, uh, it's, it's a little blue because of the dye, otherwise it wouldn't be blue. But we had a little bit down here of sodium polyacrylate. It's the same kind of stuff that's in baby diapers. It's the same kind of stuff that you use if you're going away, you buy these pellets that you put in the plants and so you water it once and then it'll give out the water over two or three days or even a week or so forth to release the water. So that water then turned to a gel, see, so that's what happened there. Now, are you disappointed now that you found out? Huh? <laughs> How about the wine trend? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the water, the, that is called a clock reaction. And all, all you have to, because we basically used, uh, we used uh, sodium bisulfide, li staple liquid starch, sulfuric acid, and one other I can't remember right now. Uh, but you, you make those two mixtures there and then you have what's called a clock reaction, iodine reaction. So if you, if you just type in, Google in, clock reaction, that'll come up. Because almost every teacher who teaches physics or chemistry will do various kinds of clock reactions there, see. Some are very involved. Uh, there's one that uh, the ingredients have to be very precise. It'll go from uh, green to gold to green to gold to green to gold, and that's a favorite of the Packers. See, like that. That's a tough one. But it's a, you have to get it just right there. See, so it's called a clock reaction. There, see. If you were very observant, I, th I bet you were. This chemical here was slightly colored, like a little bit milky there. See, like that. And and you might have guessed. Uh, well, now why do you have to pour one liquid into another? Well, that starts the reaction, of course. See, like that. And those two mix. 
Yes. I have, I think it's called a Galileo thermometer. It's a big mm -hmm. glass tube. Yes. Yeah. How does that work? Well, the water, yeah, the water changes the temperature. The water changes temperature. Yeah. If it's one for ten measuring temperature. Right. Yeah. And uh, those the little devices, usually a ball, mm -hmm. those are uh, calibrated for a very specific density of water. And so then the, 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 you get a gradient that, that that's how that works there. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very good questions here. Is that, is that the same as the uh, instrument used to measure the, the amount of antifreeze you got in the radiator, how strong it is? Yeah, you're measuring the specific gravity there, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And th those uh, various ones, uh, very simple ones, uh, have little balls in the tube, and because they're various density balls there, see, like that, and they, they tell you uh, the very concentration. Very similar to the... Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Question on, on the uh, hammering the bottom out of that bottle. Yeah. I, I thought you had two-thirds of it liquid and the other third was air. Yeah. It, it, it is, Why didn't the air compress it? The air did compress. Well, yeah. it <coughs> compressed it. Uh, it's, I, it's, it's put enough hammer on the water to drive the bottom out, apparently. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Now, there's another thing that's involved there, too, uh, that it's a shock wave, too, that goes to the glass. So if you took an empty glass that didn't have any water in it, it had all air, you could make it work, but it would be tougher, see? And yeah, I've, I've, I've made it work with quarter full, half full, three-fourths full. Didn't seem to make a difference how much water you had in there. And the, the best glasses to use for that are those cheap, uh, like, wine coolers. Uh, if you try it with a Coke bottle, it's too thick. It won't work there, see? Um, can't get Coke bottles anywhere anymore. Anyway. Beer bottle? Pardon? Beer bottle? I worked with beer bottles, yeah. Uh, that, that works fine. Most beer bottles, however, are colored. So when you put the water in there, the person can't see how much water is in there. So I think the one that I used here was a wine cooler, if I'm not mistaken. One of those glasses that's not too thick will work pretty well. I used to use one with, uh, it was apple cider that came out from Oregon. I, I, I would buy a whole case of those, they'd last for as long as I did the, that uh, demonstration class, it last five or six years, that supply there, see. Mm -hmm. And at, at the time I thought that was the only bottle that worked, but I found that if you get bottles like that, they will work too. <clears throat> yes? Being a gardener, um, I've done this uh, trick where when they predict really cold temperatures, uh -huh. instead of covering your garden, you can spray it. Spray it, yeah. And it all turns to ice. Mm -hmm. And what I've heard is the ice uh, has some energy in it or something and actually keeps the plant from freezing. That's right, exactly right, yeah. In our area, of course, the cranberry growers are flooding or spraying a lot for various times to keep the fruit from, and down south they do it for orange groves and stuff, yeah. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? You'd think you put water on there and you see the water freezing. you think, well, gee, the, the oranges are going to freeze, the berries are going to freeze. But that, that doesn't, it works just the opposite there. Kind of amazing. Any other? Yeah. Can you say a few things about sublimation? Well, sublimation, uh, good question, that's going from a solid state to a gas state without going through the liquid phase. The most common one is dry ice. Dry ice, you put some down there, uh, and let it there over a period of hours, it'll disappear, but it does not wet the surface. It does not go through that liquid state there, see? Now, regular ice will sublimate too. We don't notice that because it's so little and so, uh, takes such a long time. But if you watch a patch of ice outside your house, watch very carefully how big it is, and you don't get any really melting at all, and you keep, keep an eye on that, that ice gets smaller and smaller over days. But again, we just don't notice that because it's such a, 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 a long time for that to happen. For us too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Especially, yes. Especially when it's windy. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so yeah. is there a, um, is a way to explain the science behind why it doesn't look like we're first? What, why does it jump that? Uh, you know, I don't have a good explanation oh, okay. for that. I, I'd have to Probably go. Physics, I've heard of that. Yeah, I'd have to go look that up. Um, I, I'm just not sure of that. Uh, I, why that happens? To what? Why it happens? To only certain substances too. There you go. There's another thing too that is interesting about ice and water is called regulation. 
and that's the melting under pressure, see? And you can take a big chunk of ice and put a, a wire across the top and then weight that water, weight that, uh, that thing, and that, that's the ribbon of uh, string or wire will march right down through. And because it's melting under the pressure of the weight, and then it's freezing again on top. And that's what happens when kids or anybody goes ice skating, see? Their ice skate actually melts the ice, and then as the ice uh, passes over, it freezes again. So they're using regulation all the time. And if it's really cold, like 20 below or 30 below, kids used to say, it's too cold to ice skate. And they didn't mean physical getting cold, they meant that, that their ice skate was not actually melting the ice underneath the skate, see, because regulation was just not working. So it was kind of sticky down, see, like that. Yeah. Any others? Yes? Was the question over there why ice gets lighter when it freezes? Was that his question? Uh, when ice gets lighter? Why water, water gets lighter with Oh, well, it question? becomes, becomes uh, less dense? Yeah, yeah that, that's a good point. Um, what happens there, it's kind of hard to explain without a diagram, but uh, water is a, uh, it has six-sided structure, uh, like an ice, like a snowflake. And so those molecules, when it's, when it's uh, water, they're all, I used to show this using kids as examples, that's all, they're all real close together. See, when it's water, and they can move around because water moves around on itself. But when it gets ice then, they all link up at, at certain points on the molecule. That takes up more space when they all link up there, see, like that. And they can only touch at certain points, that's where oxygen and hydrogen are together there. And so that takes up more space and that's why it's expanding then, see, yeah. That might be a good place to stop. I'm sure mm -hmm. if you have any other questions that come up later, we'd be willing to stick yeah. around. But I'd like to thank Larry mm -hmm. for being here tonight.